Good day. Welcome to In Harmony with Nature. I'm your host for this show, Shalom Mandeville. Um, this show is part two of the last week's show, namely Life Through Time as, um, as expressed through um, discovery of fossils in rock. I'm very proud to present to you my uh, guest, Dr. Harvey Donahoe, who is the Director of uh, Public Education and um, I guess Public Awareness of the Nova Scotia Department of Mines and Energy. Dr. Harvey Donahoe has a doctorate degree in geology and um, he's also a part-time professor at Dalhousie University. In addition, he gives uh, extension courses that means non-credit courses in um, areas, very interesting areas like prospecting for gold, if you want to discover gold and things like that. So Dr. Donahue, perhaps um, in a nutshell, you can describe what we discussed in part one. Thank you, Shlom. Yes, in part one, we covered uh, quite a bit of space and time. We were looking at fossils through time, and I talked about what fossils are, any kind of record of past life, mainly from the hard parts, too. And we looked at the age of the Earth, and we looked at that as being about six billion years old, with life first coming in for the rock uh, record around 3.2 billion years ago. And then we looked at the explosion of life that came in the last uh, part of the Precambrian era, just around 600 million years ago and into the Paleozoic era, beginning at 600 and running to 250 million years ago, where we actually have all of the life forms that we have on Earth now, all of the soft-bodied uh, but hard exoskeleton forms like clams and mussels, uh, corals, sponges, all of those, plus animals that we've never heard of before and have never seen again since 570 million years ago. And all of the inhabitants of the ocean, this Paleozoic time was the age of uh, the beginning of trees, the beginning of fishes, the beginning of amphibians, the beginning of reptiles, and the beginning, perhaps, of mammals. Beginning of uh, fishes uh, as we know them? Fishes, not quite as we know them. Mm -hmm. In fact, what I'd like to do is start looking at some of those fishes and see what they were like. They're pretty awesome creatures, <laughs> let me tell you. I don't think you'd want to go out there, even with a 30-pound test line, yeah. and troll for one of these. But, so, uh, so we should be looking at the slides now, then? Yes. Sure. Yes. Some of the uh, interesting things that I've shown through last week is a chart that shows the changes in life forms through time. And the center strip that goes up the middle in blue in this part is the different times that geologists have recorded for life forms. And we're looking at the Silurian period at the lower part, right in the middle of the Devonian period. This is right in the center of Earth history in the Paleozoic. And if you look on the left-hand side, there's fishes. And there's a fish on the right-hand side, a couple of them. The Devonian is known as the age of fishes. And right in the center, crossing the bottom of that blue strip, is sort of a sea scorpion, a relative of the present-day scorpions that we have on land. Just, just to get an idea, what would the real-life di dimensions of those uh, fish? What are the dimensions? Okay, the scorpion that goes across that uh, bottom of the middle of the chart there would be in the order of uh, 20 centimeters or so. The fish, the fish that are just above it to the right and to the left, they could be uh, quite a bit larger, up to three or four meters. Most were considerably less. Most were less than one meter. But there are some awful ones that uh, I'll show you in a few slides later on. Now, there's one little animal, or one group of animals, that's very interesting that we have abundant fossils of. And just at the left side of that scorpion that sort of wanders across the blue stripe, there's a stalk that comes up with a flower on the top. That's called a, uh, a sea lily, and these are all over parts of Nova Scotia, especially in the Arisag area. And I brought some samples of that with me tonight. Uh, here's uh, some of the stalks right here. In fact, uh, I'll show you both of these uh, samples. So we're going to go from what the ideal picture looks like in that slide to what's in my hands right here. 
And these are the stalks right here that I'm showing. And these grew off the ocean floor. And if I can use my hands uh, to sort of, my arm to represent the stalk, and my hand is sort of the top part, the tentacles like this. So the stalk grew like this, and the tentacles sort of waved in the current, picking up little animals. And here's a larger specimen. This is uh, quite a big one here. And here we actually have the top of one of these stalks. This is where the animal, the colonial animal, lived, right there. This is a stalk. That's another stalk. And of course, these are hard parts, so they're preserved. And that's the key in fossils. It's only the rare occurrence, special conditions, that preserve soft parts. It's just the hard parts that really make it. So here we have it, a sea lily, some 380, 400 million years old. But what were the seas like in other parts? Well, I think uh, what we should do is go back and have a look at some of the illustrations because some of these fossils are so big that I could never even think of bringing them in here. <laughs> and that'll be true of part two here because we've gone from smaller fossils and smaller life forms during part one and the older part of geologic history. Now we're getting into life forms that are much bigger. And of course, I'd fill the table. There'd be no room here. And especially when we get to the age of dinosaurs, some of them being 70 feet, you know, just astoundingly large. But this next slide that I want to talk about has some very interesting features. This is one of the earlier amphibians. Here we are. And I really mean that. Here we are. This is where we first began moving out of the waters of the ocean and breathing air. Now, amphibians, like today, need part of their life cycle in water. About this, eight? This would be in the Devonian period. This would be about 360 million years ago. So these creatures lived on the shores of fresh water and perhaps salt water. But in the salt water, let's see if we have uh, some of these. Now, there is a brute. This bony fish was one of the largest that we've ever found in the early seas of the mid-Paleozoic, some 380, 360 million years ago. And just to give you an idea of size, there's the jaws, and just in front of the fish, ready to be gobbled up for supper, is another one that's only part of the size, perhaps less than a meter. Because this fish that I'm looking at was perhaps in the order of three to four meters in length. Fearsome beasts. On land, there's some interesting things. And when I switch from uh, the sea to the land, there's the forest. That's what the forest looked like in the middle of the Paleozoic. We don't have anything like it today, except in uh, some very primitive plants. But these are the most primitive that we found. And in Nova Scotia, there are fossils of this. And I'll show you in a moment. But these were simple stalks. They were not plants as we know them, certainly not flowering plants like we have all around us today. But these are primitive plants that use spores for reproduction. And they grew underneath the surface as sort of rootlets with uh, these vertical sections springing up. And the total height, not much more than a meter. So that's what the early land was like. And this is a very interesting concept. Uh, few of us ever think about uh, what the land was like. And I think uh, one of the most in interesting parts of this is that when we look at a picture like that, that doesn't give us the green or the color that we have today. In fact, that's what the land was like. It was shades of tan, gray, with very little vegetation. This was only around the fresh waters, the streams. And outside of that, we had very little else. So what we've done now is we've gone through uh, that large block of time that's sort of pink colored, that's called Precambrian time, and we've gone from 600 million years to 250 million years, that's the Paleozoic time, Paleozoic era. And now we want to look at some of the late stages of the Paleozoic era. Now this is fun because this is the time of plants. This is the time of Joggins and the coal seams. 
This is the time of abundance of uh, all sorts of things happening on Earth. For instance, the change from uh, amphibians into the evolution of reptiles. And very much later, we had the beginning of mammal-like reptiles. So there is a wild change going on here. And now everything was becoming larger. We were no longer confined to small animals, small colonial animals. Now we're dealing with animals that begin to approach the size of you and I. And of course, the fish you just saw was quite large. But now things are getting very large indeed. But you know, I want to show you, uh, before we go on to look at the force of the Carboniferous period of Joggins, here with me is some of those primitive plants. These little smudges of carbon right along here that show up so well in the light, these are actually the plant stems. And there's no adornment to them. They're simply straightforward stems that stood up and then when they fell down, they were preserved by this thick, sticky mud. And this is right in the middle of the Cobequid Highlands, north of Turo. So Nova Scotia has an abundance of these uh, very old fossils, very primitive plants right here. And these are, of course, uh, really great finds for paleontologists because we can make the change and see the changes from the times of uh, the mid-Paleozoic to the later part of the Paleozoic during the Cold Ages. Now, let's have a look at those. The Cold Ages were quite something. They were the period of time that uh, are the upper part of the Paleozoic. And you can see on the left-hand side, the vertical column there represents the color. The colors represent different times. And you can see in the lower left a tree. It's actually not a tree as we know trees. And I'll use the tree as just a good handle. But that's a fern that stood perhaps uh, 10 to 15 meters high. And you can see it had an awning above the top, and it created a forest-like cover. But look at all those other creatures there. On the left-hand side of the colored column, there's this thing with a great big sail back to it. That was the earliest form of a mammal-like reptile. So here we're beginning to get into the transition where we have something that really looks interesting to us, because that's the beginning of us, perhaps. And then there's the beginning of uh, larger reptiles that grew into dinosaurs. So as I say, this is an exciting period of time. And at Joggins, where these people are looking for the fossils, it's really quite something. A spectacular area to go to. Because what can you find? You can find all of these tree trunks. And you can see branches of trees. And these are ferns now. But you can see all of these different things all around. The hammer handle there is about uh, 15 centimeters long. So the trunk there is uh, a fairly big tree. And these trunks have been preserved in vertical stands, just the way they were. And they didn't cave in. Apparently, there was no wind for a long period of time. And they stood there and were preserved, were fossilized. So what did a scene of the Carboniferous look like during the time of Joggins? Well, there it is. We had all sorts of creatures. There was lots of uh, cover. The ferns were really big. There was big horsetails, like in the right side of that diagram. Or there are great big tall ferns with big branches and fronds that gave lots of shade. There were scorpions. There were big, uh, big bugs that flew around, dragonflies. There were the beginnings of reptiles. There were certainly amphibians. There was abundant fish. This area teemed with life. And it was all because it was sort of in the center of a great big mass of land called Pangaea. And right through the center of Pangaea ran the equator. So it was warm, rich in, uh, in ground, good for growing all of the large trees and so on, and an abundance of life forms. It was joined to Africa, wasn't it? Yes, yes. You can see Africa and South America join there. And although we haven't, we can't clarify exactly what it was like because there's so many unknowns, you can see North America up against the Horn of Africa, or not the Horn, but the Bulge of Africa, and then parts of what looked like, well, Eastern Europe, Central Europe, British Isles, all jammed in there. But right through it, right through the middle of it, is the equator. And all those red spots on there are coal fields. 
Now here is one of the creatures that I personally would want to meet just because it looks awful. It was just one of these little critters <laughs> that uh, ate all of the things that were left on the forest floor. It's called an Arthropleura, and it's a relative of insects. It has a segmented body, and it just crawled around and ate things. It's sort of like the uh, wood lice, I think they're called, the gray things that are segmented that are in uh, rotten wood. Well, here's what it looks like in its habitat. There he is, crawling right out at you. <laughs> and as I say, some of these were uh, things that you would not want to meet just because they, they look worse than they are. This one is about a meter long. We've seen tracks that suggest at Joggins there were Arthropleura up to one meter in length. Certainly not what you'd want to take home and show in your back pocket. Now this creature is the beginning of the dinosaurs. It's the earliest known reptile. Reptiles have scaly outsides, and they're different than mammals because they don't bear their young alive. And mammals have fur on the outside. Those are the main distinguishing points. There's many others, too. But here is the beginning of the age of dinosaurs, right here, at the time of the coal swamps. And here is the beginning, perhaps, of mammals. This is a reptile that looked something, it had some tendencies towards mammals. And so we call it mammal-like. But that great big sail was uh, developed, I guess, for keeping him cool or keeping him hot. We're not quite sure, but we believe that it had something to do with uh, warming and cooling. And this, this guy lived at the end of the Paleozoic era, some 250 million years ago, just on the edge of the age of dinosaurs. And I think that's where we are. We're beginning to, in this, this part of the show, is work our way into one of the most exciting periods of Earth history, the age of dinosaurs. But before we do that, let me just remind you that even in Nova Scotia, we have some wonderful things, trackways of amphibians. And here are some that I'm holding right here that come from the area around Horton Bluff in the Avon River. And these are part of a group of rocks that existed in the early part, middle part, of the Carboniferous, just before the coal swamps of Joggins and Picto and Sydney. And here are the trackways. Excuse me, no, actually what these are are casts. That is, the real orientation is like this. So this is the bottom of the layer right here, and this is the infilling of a trackway that's made by the depression of the claws going around. And we can tell a lot because when we look at the structures, you can see some of the uh, structures here reflected on the light. These are ripple marks, and there's mud cracks and so on. So what we think is these guys were working along the edge of a lake, either looking for fish in the shallows or looking for small animals that were nearby to go after. And it looks like he was walking because the footprints are not very far apart. So he's just sort of walking along like this, looking for prey. <laughs> Quite a bit that geologists can tell just looking at uh, things and using a little bit of reasoning. OK, now we're poised to go into the age of dinosaurs. Let's see what it looks like. And Nova Scotia has something to say about this. But first, I have to remind everybody, here are mammals. There is a mammal, the earliest mammal. It had fur, no doubt. And that's where we evolved from through a long period of geologic time, over 200 million years. So with that, this, this animal, called a mammal, stayed in, in geologic, geological terms relative seclusion and really did nothing. It, there was no major changes because it was the dinosaurs, the reptiles, that looked after this next period of geologic time, the Mesozoic. And here at Parsboro, just south of Parsboro, at Wasson's Bluff, we have one of the most exciting discoveries in any of the areas that have rocks of the age of dinosaurs. Here at Wasson's Bluff, we found some of the smallest and some of the largest dinosaurs. But yet it was the most surprising find because when we went looking for it, look what we found just chunks 
That's that chunk there with the white in it. The white is the bone. The chunks of bone were only a couple of centimeters across. We had no skeletons. We were looking at a deposit that was created by a disaster, by a major catastrophe. And it took a lot of painstaking work to find jaws, find leg bones, things like that. So we began to feel that there was quite a bit more. And as I go on and talk about this, I'm going to show in the next slide a series of what, what some of these animals look like, some of these dinosaurs look like. So that's what we found, and here's how we reconstructed some of them. Now this comes not only from Parsboro, but from many of the areas that have these rocks and have the same bones. But there's all sorts of different sizes. And there's a big bar graph, sort of a great big three-dimensional solid there on the left, and there's bars that run up and down on it. Well, you can see that the bars define a line that goes across there in the middle. We had a catastrophe represented in the rocks at Parsboro. All of those bars that go up part way and don't go up into the soft blue at the top are animals, dinosaurs, that became extinct. And the bars that run up through represent the animals that go all the way to the top of the rocks, to the youngest rocks that we have in the Parsboro area. So something happened. We're not sure what it is. It might have been an asteroid impacting somewhere on the Earth and creating a minor disturbance such as putting all sorts of dust in the air and so on. But Parsboro has a fascinating array of, uh, of these dinosaurs. A lot of the work's been done by the Nova Scotia Museum and by uh, complementary work from the United States, from various institutions there, Columbia University, Yale University. So together, we're finding out a lot about this history. And the history is quite fascinating because We've left the age of plants like this, which are in a red sandstone, and you can just barely see the impression of this leaf right here. And I'm going to pick up one more here. And this one you can see very clearly, because this is a beautiful specimen of a, of a fern. So here we have all of the plants that are the coal period, and just by comparison, very little in this blue color, in the green color, of plants from the age of dinosaurs. So it appears like plants were, even though they were evolving and changing quite a bit, they weren't in ascendancy during the Triassic, during the Mesozoic, when the dinosaurs were there. Although we know in other areas away from Parsboro, there are certainly large amounts of plant that supported all sorts of huge dinosaurs. So it wasn't that there weren't plants, it's just that in the Parsboro area there were very few. Let's step off and look at these dinosaurs now, because we've got some fascinating things. Dinosaurs, uh, you know, as I'm going to show in my yardstick of Earth history, in the right there with the long neck, he was a dweller in the ocean. Look at that one right above him with the great big horns. He lived on land, apparently uh, ate not very much meat, but a lot, of, uh, a lot of vegetation. And on the left, the fearsome beast with all sorts of big teeth, one of the Allosaurus type ones. And just awful beasts. I'll just show you a few more. We found some fascinating things, clutches of eggs like this. So we know something about dinosaurs and their nesting in the Gobi Desert. And this next picture is stupendous. There is a dinosaur fetus, apparently before birth or breaking out of the egg. So we can actually go back in time and look at what they were like before breaking out of the egg. And we can document what the young were like and what they were like. And by looking at the trackways around these nests, we have the sense that some dinosaurs, like this, were actually in groups, communal groups. And like many animals, sort of in a general sense in herds, looked after their own by living communally and looking after each other's through aunts and uncles, in a sense, looking after each other's offspring. So we have a different view as we begin to study dinosaurs quite a bit. And I think one of the more exciting things is this bird, and I'm going to sort of follow up uh, the last little word here on dinosaurs, is how this bird, Archaeopteryx, like that, 
sort of goes from a very bird-like reptile at the very bottom, right down there. As we go upward, there's Archaeopteryx in the center. And as we go up a little bit further, there's a common crow. And there's one thing that unifies it. It's the shape of the head and the bone structures. So actually, by looking at dinosaurs, we've learned a lot about uh, the evolution of other forms, including birds. And that's one of the most interesting things, I think, that uh, geologists have begun to pick up. So you've seen here just, uh, just a small part of the age of dinosaurs and the changes that have come about in these two uh, parts of the show, Life Through Time. It's uh, really quite a story. Geologists are really excited about these fossils and rocks. And Nova Scotia has a lot of these. I don't think we have seen this uh, specimen. I know. This is uh, one perhaps I could save for last. Uh, <laughs> some of us were chuckling about it. It looks like macaroni. <laughs> This is uh, a local specimen from uh, near the Avon River at Windsor, and it's a whole bunch of little seashells, because at that time, that time of the rocks there at Windsor, it was a deep inland sea that had all sorts of abundant life in it. Sometimes it got so salty, though, that it uh, created vast deposits of either gypsum or salt, and that's where a lot of our mineral industry comes from, this group of rocks. So the conjecture is that um, at the time of the dinosaurs, the life was extinguished, right? Uh, due to a meteorite uh, impact. That's or certainly something. one of the ideas. Okay. Uh, competing, so, competing with that is uh, mm -hmm. volcanoes. But we think right. now the evidence is for an asteroid. Asteroid. I'm sorry. And that the, was 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs ended, mm -hmm. and apparently the mammals adapted, and were able to survive. So they did survive then? That's right. The, ma the mammals that mm -hmm. I showed, the very early mammal, rat-like, mm -hmm. that and its cousins and so on, survived much later. And How old is us. man anyway? The are, history are, of... Are the you history considered of, as mammals? Yes. That's we are mammals mm -hmm. and we uh, go back about four million years or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. And of course recorded history is a very short period of that time. Well, I feel I'm four million years old. <laughs> So you've just been watching um, parts one and two of an extremely interesting show uh, titled um, Life Through Time. And you've been watching uh, a top expert geologist and paleontologist, Dr. Javi Donahoe of the Nova Scotia Department of Mines and Energy. Thank you. <laughs>